Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Welcome to the U.S. Center. This event is America the Beautiful, United States efforts to conserve lands and waters. And now I'm so excited to welcome to the stage Brenda Mallory, Chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Please give her a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. It's always great to look out to this full house. I'm glad, pleased to be here with you today, and thanks so much for joining us for this session. She said, my name is Brenda Mallory. I'm the chair of the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Um, in a few minutes, uh, I will have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker and our distinguished panel. But before I do that, I'm excited to speak briefly about the Biden-Harris administration's historic conservation accomplishments. Our world, our environment are rapidly changing. We're facing a mounting and complex set of interrelated challenges, including pressures of climate change, long-running environmental injustices and inequities, and the rapid loss of nature. Around the world, wildlife species are disappearing at an unprecedented rate. Climate change is really reshaping our ecosystem. Habitat loss and degradation, over-harvesting, pollution, invasive species, and disease are disrupting the natural systems that supply our food, clean water, clean air, and that are indispensable to economies and the cultures everywhere. The nature crisis demands action. That is why, since day one, President Biden has delivered on not only the most ambitious climate agenda in U.S. history, but also the most ambitious conservation agenda as well. In 2021, President Biden established the first national conservation goal to protect, conserve, and restore at least 30% of the U.S. lands and waters by 2030. To reach this goal, the, the Biden-Harris administration launched the America the Beautiful initiative. It's a call to action to tackle the climate and nature crises, create jobs and strengthen the economy, and increase equitable access to nature. To accomplish these goals, we are supporting locally-led, voluntary, community-designed, and partnership-driven work across the country. Or to put it more simply, we're helping ranchers and farmers, forest owners and tribal nations, towns, cities, and communities conserve, restore, protect the lands and waters that they love. We're making this happen and we're making progress. Since the taking of office, President Biden has protected or restored protections for more than 26.7 million acres of lands and waters in the United States. That includes designating five new national monuments, including the Abiquame National Monument in Nevada, and the ancestral footprints of the Grand Canyon in Arizona. Uh, these are lands that are sacred to tribal nations. In Alaska, President Biden has protected Bristol Bay, a large and a large swath of the Arctic Ocean. In Minnesota, the Boundary Waters watershed, our country's most visited wilderness area. In Texas, Kastner Range, providing important outdoor areas for nearby El Paso. There's also marine sanctuaries in the Pacific and Atlantic, the Everglades, the Columbia River. The list of places uh, our administration is protecting goes on and on, responding to locally-led, community-driven efforts to protect these important lands and waters. I'm extremely proud of what we've done under the President's leadership. I'm also proud that thanks to the President's legislative accomplishments, our administration is delivering once-in-a-generation investments in conservation and resilience. Also as part of the America the Beautiful initiative, federal agencies have been working to develop the American Conservation and Stewardship Atlas, a data and mapping project to help illustrate the scope, scale, and progress of conservation efforts across the country. We will have an update on that preliminary effort uh, in the coming weeks. The Atlas, as well as a new U.S. National Nature Assessment 
that is in progress and that is on track to be completed in 2026 are both tools we are developing to help provide information that communities need to continue to accelerate conservation and expand access to the outdoors. It's clear the interwoven climate, nature, and equity crises call for bold and united efforts to foster a sustainable and just future. We know that while we have made enormous strides, there is still a lot more work to do. And that's why I'm so excited about the panel and the discussion that we're about to have. But first, I'm pleased to welcome to the stage my colleague and conservation champion in his own right, the U.S. Department of Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack, who is here to share more about his agency uh, supporting farmers, ranchers, and the stewards of working lands in leading on conservation. Please welcome Secretary Vilsack. Uh, Brenda, thank you very, very much, and more importantly, thank you for your leadership. Uh, uh, Brenda's been kind of the captain of the team. Um, she has been shepherding a whole-of-government approach, uh, and you'll see that on display here. We've uh, looked forward to working with CEQ and our colleagues in the Department of Interior and NOAA and in the states uh, for uh, advancing the cause of conservation uh, as uh, she described it. Uh, and I want to say that from our perspective, America the Beautiful is an exciting effort to support conservation across the country, and USDA is proud to be part of this initiative. I think it's fair to say uh, when it was structured, it was intended to reflect a broad range of efforts by ranchers and farmers, uh, fishermen and women, forest owners, tribal nations, and communities to safeguard the health and the integrity of the lands and waters upon which all of us depend. For USDA, a critical part of the initiative is the inclusion of private working lands that are the backbone of many rural communities. Enrolling in conservation programs for these lands remains voluntary and is driven by the private landowners themselves. And I've, I think it's fair to say that we are seeing an overwhelming interest from American farmers, ranchers, and private forest landowners in signing up for these programs. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Since 2021, we've seen a significant increase in USDA's premier conservation program for marginal lands, the Conservation Reserve Program, or CRP. In recent years, we've enrolled over 4 million new acres in CRP, which represents a 20% increase. Critically, we've dramatically increased the sign-ups in the CRP Grasslands Initiative, moving from 1.8 million acres in that program in 2021 to 8.6 million acres this year, an increase of 364%. Reflecting the interest that landowners have in voluntary conservation, Congress invested, and with the President's leadership, uh, was able to achieve a nearly $20 billion increase as an additional suite of USDA conservation programs in the President's signature climate law, the Inflation Reduction Act. Through this act, USDA has enrolled more farmers and more acres in voluntary conservation programs than at any point in time in history, following a backlog that existed for many years. In 2023, USDA enrolled over 5,000 additional producers in conservations across 50 states. This above what would otherwise have been possible through Farm Bill and appropriation funding, and it's going to provide significant climate mitigation value, as well as significant environmental co-benefits for the producers. As Brenda indicated, the Inflation Reduction Act provides a generational investment in urban conservation as well through the USDA's Forest Service Urban and Community Forestry Program, where we will invest in tree planting and maintenance efforts in 385 projects in underserved communities across the United States, investing over a billion dollars in that effort. USDA's conservation efforts are not just limited to private working lands. We also happen to be home to the U.S. Forest Service 
which stewards 193 million acres of publicly owned for, uh, national forests for the benefit and enjoyment of the American people. And we're also engaged in pursuing community-driven conservation proposals for these public lands. We restored roadless protections on the 17 million acre Tongass National Forest in Alaska, our largest national forest, and the only significant stretch of coastal temperate rainforest left on this planet. Under President Biden's leadership, we've designated new protections for national forest lands across the country. An example includes the historic Camp Hale in Colorado, which was designated as a protected national monument last fall. Camp Hale was home to the Ute people long before recorded history and has a unique place in our nation's military and outdoor recreation history. Places like Camp Hale are treasured pieces of a national heritage worth protecting. And finally, following an executive order from President Biden, the U.S. Forest Service has been working on a science-based effort to ensure old growth forests persist and increase across our national forests now and into the future. These forests, as you all know, store significant carbon and provide a host of other important benefits for water, biodiversity, recreation, and for indigenous people. Uh, the Forest Service began uh, this effort with a first of its kind inventory of mature and old growth forests across federally owned lands, which was completed earlier this year. And we're looking forward to the next steps in this effort and continuing to make progress in protecting and restoring these important and unique forests. It's also fair to say that we're also investing a record amount of resource by virtue of the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act in a wildfire crisis strategy that's allowing us to do a better job of managing our forests as well against the risk of catastrophic wildfire. It certainly has been an honor to be here today to reflect briefly on USDA's longstanding commitment to conservation across public and private lands that our department touches. Uh, thank you again. I look forward to uh, the important uh, in continued work of conservation. I know the President is personally interested and involved in this, and I think he uh, recognizes that uh, all of his agencies and departments have been working incredibly hard uh, to reach record and historic results. Thank you all very much. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. I really appreciate your partnership. Uh, and now I would like to invite the panelists on stage for today's conversation. All right. <laughs> Don't mind me. Um, okay, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our esteemed panel uh, for today's uh, conservation discussion. We'll begin first with uh, Shannon Estenos, the Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at the Department of Interior. As the Assistant Secretary, Shannon oversees the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, and the Office of Everglades Restoration Initiatives. Confirmed by the United States Senate in June of 2021, Assistant Secretary Estenos is a member of the Interior Secretary Deb uh, Holland's leadership team and plays a major role in uh, helping drive the Biden-Harris administration's uh, conservation agenda. Thank you, Shannon, for being here. Uh, next, we have Dr. Uh, Rick Spinrad, the uh, Undersecretary of NOAA. Dr. Spinrad serves as the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and uh, Atmosphere and is the Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. He is responsible for the strategic direction and the oversight of the agency and its over 12,000 employees, including developing NOAA's uh, portfolio of products and services to address the climate crisis, enhancing environmental sustainability, and fostering economic development and creating a more just, equitable, and diverse and inclusive NOAA workforce. Thank you, Rick. We have next uh, Karen Ross, the Secretary of California's Department of Food and Agriculture. 
Karen Ross was appointed uh, secretary of the California Department of Food and Agriculture first by Governor Jerry Brown in 2011, and then again by Governor Newsom in 2019. Secretary Ross is focused on protecting and promoting California agriculture, investing in the department's employees to provide the best service to farmers, ranchers, and consumers, and fostering an agricultural industry that embraces its role as a global leader on everything from the most technical aspects of farming to the broadest and, and environmental imperatives, including climate change. Thank you, Karen. And finally, we have Inse Adu Witherspoon. Um, Inse it has served as the executive director of the Children's Environmental uh, Health Network for the past 20 years. In that work, she strengthens key partnerships while organizing, leading, and managing policy, education, training, and science-related programs. She serves as a, new, as a key spokesperson for children's vulnerabilities and the need for their protection. Uh, Nse is also a founding co-chair of the America, America the Beautiful for All Coalition. Thank you, Nse. Thank you to all of um, this group for being part of our program today. And so we're, our, our, um, our approach is we're going to have uh, each of the, the panelists to give us a few opening remarks, and then we'll have some questions to follow. So um, I'm going to begin with uh, Assistant Secretary Estenos. Um, when most people think of conservation, the first thing that many people think of is the America's uh, National Park System. And, and maybe the second, they think of the National Wildlife Refuge. Um, those are obviously significant parts of the Interior Department's mandate. Um, but can you tell us um, more about the Department's kind of recent efforts to ensure that conservation uh, actions help reflect the full story of America? Thank, thank you, Chair Mallory, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't think it can be overstated the importance of what President Biden did when he set the nation's first conservation goal, 30 by 30. But he didn't just tell us what to do. He told us how to do it. And he said, you're going to do it in partnership. You're going to do it uh, with community, uh, community design, community led. You're going to do it with tribes. Um, you're going to be collaborative and you're going to be driven by science. And Interior has, under Secretary Holland's leadership, really internalized both the mission and the method. And we have worked very hard um, since day one to really dye the method into the wool of everything that we do. At the heart of our America the Beautiful work, or near the heart, is the America the Beautiful challenge. Um, the president announced leveraging $1 billion uh, over the next several years to invest in um, conserving lands and waters across our country. So this goes well beyond parks and refuges, which of course um, are, there are treasured landscapes, but we know that every community has its treasured landscape. Every community has its important rivers and streams. Every tribe has its homeland. And so it's important in America, the beauty, beautiful really captures the importance of all of those landscapes. In 2023 alone, the challenge is producing $140 million in investments. I'm really proud that this latest tranche of grants has gone, 40% of them have gone to tribally led projects or either led by tribes or in cooperation with tribes to do everything from salmon restoration and trout, re brook, brook trout restoration, tall grass prairie restoration. Um, but that's not all. It's not just the America the Beautiful challenge. I was uh, fortunate enough to stand at the base of the Grand Tetons in August with the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, to announce $44 million uh, to invest through the National Park Service in important landscapes um, such as the Yellowstone Teton, but other landscapes across the country as well. Um, but that's not all. We are, we are cranking up the investment, not just in new projects, but in time honored, uh, projects that have been around for a long time, but it have really, have really needed a boost. This president is investing something like five times more than any other president before him in Everglades restoration. That's a program that's been around, one of the largest ecosystem restoration programs in the world. It's been around for 20 years, but never before has it enjoyed the level of investment and support from the federal government as it has in this administration. 
what's my next line? But that's not all. Um, <laughs> all of these things I'm incredibly proud of. The, the chair talked about the fact that we've established five national monuments um, in this administration, including the ancestral footprints of of the Grand Canyon, but also cultural national monuments like the Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley National Monument, which you and I stood in Mississippi together um, to see those those sites. So, and that experience, that's about the method, right? So, so those monuments have been established in partnership with community, with tribes. So, it it isn't just the mission, but it's also the method. The outdoor, and this is what I'll I'll I'll, I'll leave you with. The Outdoor Rest Recreation Legacy Partnership. This is a, a, a program that's part of the Land and Water Conservation Fund. Uh, this is a program that targets um, the nature deficit in urban areas, the inequity of access to open, pla open spaces and green spaces. It addresses heat islands in urban areas. The program was zeroed out in the last administration. It's been around for a while, but it's never enjoyed a, a really significant level of investment. This administration has cranked the investment up to our recent announcement, $224 million. I have traveled across the country, and I have visited, we call it ORLAP. It's a terrible acronym. I have visited ORLAP projects in Washington, in Michigan, in uh, Minnesota, North Carolina, Texas, Alaska. I've been all over the country. And there is nothing like standing in a community that has not had a modern playground or park or ball field or a place for their kids to play or a safe place for their kids to play and to be able to support their design, to support their ideas, to support um, the open space and the access to the outdoors that is going to bring their community, um, to help them sort of realize their ambitions for their communities. It's, it's been incredibly rewarding and it's all part of America the Beautiful. Um, anyway, that's where I'll stop. Very good. Thank There's you so more. much. <laughs> Shannon always brings great energy to her conversation and she's also, she seems to have like a knack for like, uh, sayings. This one I wrote down is, it's not just the mission, it's the method. Yesterday she had something else that she said that I really appreciate it. Um, so thank you. Oh, culture eats what? Strategy? Culture Yes, I'm definitely getting that T-shirt. All right, now we're going to turn over turn over to uh, uh, Under Under Secretary uh, Spinrad. So, um, Rick, there have been great strides in ocean conservation in the past two decades in the United States, but there is so much more to understand, manage, and protect the special places in the ocean. Uh, for example, we've learned that climate adaptive marine protected areas and other conserved areas may offset some of the climate and ocean acidification impacts that threaten marine ecosystems. Given the importance of ocean conservation for climate mitigation and adaptation, how has NOAA been leading on the historic ocean conservation efforts? Yeah, thank you for that question, Chair Mallory. And I love that I'm following Assistant Secretary Espinos because what you're going to hear in this from the U.S. government is that the conservation of our lands and waters is really the issue at hand. And so when you think about it, with the establishment of our exclusive economic zones, we actually doubled the size of the United States. And so when we talk about conservation activities in our lands and waters, the focus on ocean and marine conservation is, is really a critical component of the total portfolio. And so I'd like to spend a couple minutes talking about what we're doing to engage in conservation in the marine environment and also the connection between that conservation activity and the climate challenges that we've got. So we at NOAA obviously are dedicated to understanding and mitigating the impacts of climate change in these environments. And our mission aligns squarely with the goals of the America the Beautiful initiative, addressing threats from climate change and addressing the disappearance of nature and ensuring equitable access to the outdoors and these resources. We support these goals through marine and coastal protection, meaning meaningful engagement and collaborations with federal, state, local, tribal entities, coastal restoration investments, and I'll say a little bit more about how we've been able to do that, enabled by some of the most recent legislation. 
but possibly most importantly in building out the climate products and services that allow decision makers to make those critical decisions about where, when, and how to protect. Our work on ocean conservation builds on over five decades of experience connecting people to places by conserving and restoring those special marine, coastal, and Great Lakes areas and managing our nation's marine fisheries, another important component. This administration has been leading in some of the most active marine sanctuary designation processes since the 1990s with six sites in the designation process. Six sites currently in the designation process. I used to serve as head in the National Ocean Service, which oversees the National Marine Sanctuaries. We went for years without any designations, many years, and we have six in the portfolio right now. I want to give you a couple of highlights for three of them. In April, we initiated the designation of the Pacific Remote Islands National Marine Sanctuary. These remote islands in U.S. waters are home to some of the most diverse and abundant and remarkable marine ecosystems. Ocean exploration, another act, major activity in NOAA, is generating a host of new discoveries about life and ecological processes in the deep ocean. We don't send an ocean exploration cruise out without making a, a new major discovery, ever. Every single cruise does that. We're in the process of designating the proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary in California that would co-steward this area with indigenous people who have cared for these waters for thousands of years. And we're also working on designation of the Hudson Canyon, which is uh, the largest submarine canyon along the United States Atlantic coast. We're working with state partners as well to manage a system of national estuarine research reserves. And in celebrating these activities, we know that 30% is a milestone not an end point because ultimately we want to be able to understand the impact and the value of these activities in the context of climate change. And we have the benefit of having investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act that are going to allow us to do that. We're doing it under the context of something we call climate ready coasts. And so I would argue as we make these designations, as we conserve these uh, areas of marine environment, we should do so in a way that we understand 10, 20, 30 years from now are they still going to be the places that merit that kind of conservation activity? We've obligated almost $500 million in funding from the Climate Ready Coasts Initiative. It's going to support 150 projects across 30 coastal and Great Lakes states. And some of those funds are specifically set aside for tribes and underserved communities. So part of the portfolio here is going to be dedicated to providing conservation activities in conjunction with communities that may never have had the benefit of that. Equity is such an important component in how we build out the marine conservation agenda. And at NOAA, we have, in fact, expanded our collaboration conservation efforts to ensure that everyone has a seat at the table. We have to do that by law, but we're also doing it by design. We're doing it in a way that ensures that marginalized communities, underserved communities have a voice to define what should be conserved, but even more importantly, how it should be managed. We're also part of the America Climate Corps, announced by President Biden in September, because it's not good enough to just establish these conservation areas. We need to make sure there's a workforce that understands how to manage, how to expand, how to utilize these facilities in the future. So we look forward to maintain maintaining that momentum, to continuing to build strong partners with communities, Ocean Industries, I would add as well, and others, to really deliver on the promise of America the Beautiful for what I call the preservation of lives, livelihoods, and lifestyles in the United States. Thank you. Oh, that could also be a t-shirt. Preservation of lives, livelihood, and lifestyles. Love it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Spinrad. All right, now we're going to turn to Secretary Ross. Uh, the state of California was the first state to adopt a statewide conservation goal or, or 30 by 30 target in 2020. California is also a major agricultural producer, not just for the nation, but the world. Can you tell us more about how your agency and the state government's approach to conservation and sustainable land management has delivered on California's 30 by 30 target by supporting working lands while continuing to grow California's agricultural economy? Thank you. And I see how quickly five minutes goes. So I'll try to cram it all in there without really great ending tags. So that was excellent. Thank you. 
So for the state of California, we are a biodiversity hotspot on a global basis. And so really this started under Jerry Brown, who one day called the director of Fish and Wildlife and me in to talk about biodiversity, how do we preserve it? And, and really recognizing it's not just what happens on the land that we want to conserve or put permanent easements or purchases on. It's about species don't respect just the boundary of what's been saved. And so having compatible conservation measures and really engaging working lands was key to making the entire, the entire state work for the species that we're trying to protect. So along that line, I think Secretary Volsak called out, you know, it's voluntary, um, but it's, it's engagement and it's providing the information to help everyone know the role that they can play. So I'm going to run through some of the accomplishments to date and the investments we've been able to make in preserving species, land, and coastal waters. And with over 600 miles of coastline, we're very aware of how important that is. So to date, on our inventory in April of 2023, we have now achieved 24% of land conservation and protection, and 16% of coastal. But I think with some of those de designations, we might be able to pop that up a little bit. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm so glad I sat next to you today. Um, a very specific role as part of the, of the Biodiversity Council for the State of California. We're not the director of that. Our California Natural Resources Agency is, for all the reasons you can imagine. But one of the most important roles we do play was identifying that conservation easements on farmland and ranch land is hugely important to helping us accomplish this. Through our Strategic Growth Council to date, we've invested $373 million to conserve on a perpetual basis 194,000 acres. And the reason this is important is that based on a UC Davis study, we took a look at the role of preserving farmland in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Avoided vehicle miles, avoided greenhouse gas emissions is how we measure that. That's how we were able to quantify this to be able to achieve that, that type of opportunity. Next week, the Strategic Growth Council will be voting on another almost 50 projects over 50,000 acres, another 116, um, uh, 116 million dollars. I mean, I think of my own budget and I don't use million very often. Sorry about that. For the first time, we've really um, been able to use capacity building and technical assistance to help communities, neighbors, and tribes be able to apply for this. And I'm really proud that we have over 1,000 acres that will be preserved that are part of a tribal, tribal nation, and so we're really excited about that. When it comes to our compatible conservation practices, that's where leveraging working lands to create this whole ecosystem of health for, for all the purposes you can think of. That's where our Climate Smart Ag programs come in. Healthy soils, we've invested $125 million, million dollars in the acreage that are under our healthy soils practices. And what's important about that is that one third of the world's biodiversity is below ground. We just released a report on that in August. It's an exciting opportunity to have really th people thinking differently about those soils and the health of those soils and what that means for biodiversity. We also have a pollinator health program California with our fruits and vegetables. Pollin pollinators are important for everything, but especially for the kinds of crops that we have. We're part of the forage and the habitat for those pollinators, just as we are for the connectivity that we provide within a, within a watershed for the wildlife species and the corridors and the reasons that that makes that very, very, very important. Um, when I think about how we achieve this, it's totally with partners federal partners, local government partners, but we also have created a conservation planning program partnership with the Natural Resource Conservation Service, with the University of California Ag and Natural Resources, which is all those cooperative extension advisors throughout the state of California, and we're adding more to that, and with our California Resource Conservation Districts. I think there's 94 of them throughout our 58 counties. So we're trying to create a network that for us, because we do have a climate core, but we're about the most local-based partners 
to help perpetuate this beyond the days that will be there as political leaders within the system and when there might not be as many one time dollars to invest in this we're starting to change the culture of what it means for the next generation what it means for the jobs of the future what it means for agritourism and the beauty of being able to connect with nature thank you Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to highlight their changing culture because that is what's key. And I think you heard the themes in the federal and state programs that are emphasizing coordination, collaboration, working together, partnerships, emphasizing tribes, emphasizing communities. Uh, really appreciate uh, your, your comments there. Um, so let's move on um, and we'll hear from Inse at this point. Um, you are, you and the America the Beautiful uh, for All Coalition have been a key partner in ensuring that all communities not only see the benefits of conservation, but have the ability to lead and shape it. So can you tell us more about the importance of conservation to communities and how the America the Beautiful initiative is helping drive that? Thank you, Chair Mallory, and thank you to my esteemed panelists. Really appreciate all the leadership you continue to provide. It's really important. Um, as you heard, I'm with the Children's Environmental Health Network, so we are not your traditional conservation organization, and I think that's the beauty um, of this um, collaboration for sure. We're a national nonprofit also doing global work that for over three decades has been working to protect all children from environmental hazards and also very much from the impacts of the changing climate. We also, though, do understand that we are all very connected as humans and living species to our environments. Our tribal and our indigenous leaders have been teaching us about this connection for entirety, and many of us in our own homes and families have learned about that connection as well, including myself. So we all stand to benefit when our waterways, when our air is cleaned up. That asthmatic child and asthma is still the number one chronic illness, at least in the U.S., when that child whose asthma is probably exacerbated most likely from polluted air, it may have even been caused by polluted air, that child stands to benefit greatly when our conservation goals are met. When harmful chemicals like neurotoxins are not as rampant through our water systems and through our agricultural community and contaminating our soils, that also is a scenario that we are looking forward to because that is also a benefit of reaching our conservation goals. So as was mentioned, I'm very honored to be one of our co-chairs now for two years of this new America the Beautiful for All coalition. Um, it's very intentional. It's never been seen before that I'm aware of that a public health leader, a child health leader, is part of helping to shape a movement like this. We are not coming in on our own. We are certainly coming in on the backs and with our indigenous, our tribal, our community leaders. We have some in the room, Dr. Reverend Woodbury and Ms. Loretta in the front, Ms. Ife Kalamanjaro in the back. We have a range of different community leaders that we learn from and grow from and certainly are working to align with and provide a national agenda for. Some of the successes that we see the initiative and the coalition helping to support. First, this is a very audacious goal, and, and that is commanding you know, our response pertaining to the amount of urgency that we have now found ourselves in. And that is the very least that communities expect for us. Second, it, is pla it places people and the most vulnerable people at the center. That also is very unique for a conservation agenda of this size. Third, its work uplifts existing community efforts, led efforts. Again, we are not coming in, jumping in, taking over. We are listening. We are doing this hard work of relationship building. It is not easy. If this was easy, it would have been done already. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a lot of relationship building and a lot of trust, and you can't rush that. Fourth, the America, the Beautiful for All Coalition is also very serious about applying a Justice 40 metric. So while we are trying to also help this administration reach 30% protection of our water, our ocean, and our lands by 2030, we want to ensure that a Justice 40 metric of at least 40% of those protected areas also benefit the most marginalized who had nothing to do with us getting to this place. Also, the unprecedented amount of funds, you've heard about just some of them, that this administration has placed in communities, that is not to be, uh, that is not little by any means, and it is seen, and we need to continue to grow that capacity because it's going to be needed. Looking at some challenges, communities are being impacted every single day. Throughout this COP, throughout our daily lives, we are constantly hearing, unfortunately, about the battles, the serious fights that communities are undergoing. So hearing about goals that are four, five, six years away is very daunting, and these are the challenges that we all have to, to measure up and make sure that we're meeting people's needs now while also growing these larger goals. 
Also, while we're working to protect waters in land and ocean, we are also being combated every day by uh, conflicting efforts by point polluters. So we need to ensure that our agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, our state regulatory agencies, are set up to do their job, have the capacities they need, the funding they need, the legal authorities that they need when needed to make sure that our efforts are not counterproductive. And also, there are guiding principles for the America the Beautiful for All initiative, which we highly support. In particular, the one that says, pursue conservation and restoration approaches that create jobs and support healthy communities, I think offers an opportunity for us to expand on what does definition of healthy communities mean under a new umbrella of this new conservation movement that hopefully is much more inclusive of environmental justice and public health movements. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And I love the last question. What does the definition of healthy communities mean? Like that is something I think that we have to take seriously as we kind of move forward. So I appreciate all of that. Um, so we've now had an opener from all of our uh, panelists and you can uh, see the sort of uh, interlocking visions on how uh, we are working together on, on conservation in our separate spaces. Um, and it's really, to me, just sort of fascinating to hear how much overlap there really is. But I want to follow up with each of the, the panelists uh, and, and invite them to engage with each other. Um, around uh, so that we have a little bit more of a, a discussion. And so I have uh, one question for each of you that I will kick it off and then let you um, move from there. So number one, um, Dr. Svenrat, NOAA provides um, the climate, weather, and environmental information needed to shape smart policy and decision making. And I spoke a little in my opening remarks about our efforts to measure conservation uh, progress and what a clear... Um, uh, need there is for more high quality information at all levels. How can NOAA's work on science, data, and information contribute to improved domestic and global conservation? As a scientist at heart, I love that question. And, and I've got to say that oftentimes when I introduce our agency to people who might not otherwise know us, I start by saying we're a science based agency. And we've been talking about conservation here. Um, and I would argue. First of all, you cannot conserve what you cannot manage. You think about it, every city has a Department of Parks. We have a National Park Service. Uh, and you cannot manage what you cannot monitor. So how are you going to know that that environment is healthy? The goal here is less about percentages, 30 percent, and, and really more about ensuring, in the case of the ocean, that we have healthy oceans that, in fact, can contribute to climate solutions and be able to monitor, especially in an environment that is, as we scientists would say, non-stationary, that changes are happening. So you may establish that particular area of conservation. Think about Yellowstone National Park. If all of the bison, all of the wolves, all of the elk left the park, would we still have that as a park? There's a concept here that says we need to understand what's happening, what's changing in this space, and so consequently using tools that not only allow us to measure the change that's going on to assess the health of the conservation activity, but also be able to project what may happen with the ecosystem in the future. And that means using sophisticated tools like satellite observational systems, uh, climate models and projections, but also geographic information systems, because it's not enough for us to be able to make these accurate measurements and monitor the environment, we have to be able to portray the kind of changes and predicted changes we see in a way that decision makers can say, I get it, I understand. We have to apply new regulations. We have to change how we're going to ensure that we can conserve this environment. The other thing is to have methods of assessment that are rigorous, that are highly analytical, that are quantitative in nature. So we're building climate vulnerability assessments for these protected areas. I told you about the six sanctuaries that are currently in the designation process. How will we assess the vulnerability of those very special areas to climate change? By building rigorous assessments. We're also very keenly attuned to how marine biodiversity is going to change. And so building a strategy, which we have done right now, for the nation to be able to assess biodiversity is another tool. So I would argue science is at the heart, data are at the heart, and the ability to project changes are at the heart of our 
capability for informing decision makers about how best to ensure the conservation acts we undertake today will be just as valid 20 years from now. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a lawyer, and we really value data. <laughs> so, um, all right. Uh, and so I'm going to turn to you now. Um, we've talked about uh, biodiversity, climate, and equity benefits that come from conservation. Can you speak more as to why it's important to be intentional about merging the conservation movement with the climate uh, justice, environmental justice, and public health uh, movements? Thank you. This is a really personal question. I really like it because one of the many questions I got when I took on this co-chair role of this coalition was why. You certainly have enough to do. There's enough places you need to be. This movement isn't for us. This isn't for public health. This isn't for environmental justice. And while the history there may be very well true, um, it has not been a space uh, welcoming, I'd say, of environmental justice and public health movements. And we are very much, again, trying to turn that whole paradigm on its head because we recognize it has to be a one tent. We cannot have these spinoffs of silo work over here and silo work over here with the magnitude of order that's ahead of us. And the hard reality is that I do believe that we all have to rely on our conservation movements and our environmental justice movements and our public health movements to be working in the same direction. That's just critical in order to meet the kind of goals that we have. So the science, as has been talked about, I also am trained in public health, is, is available to us um, as far as the, the huge importance of uh, connection to nature, all living being especially children and adults, and what it means for our long-term and short-term health. There is no alternative than spending space and time in nature. You just cannot. People try. Uh, people try to make indoor environments that are more inclusive and welcoming and bringing outdoor elements in, but it's nothing like being outside. And even spending what the data says, even five, ten minutes of time for a child can make all the difference. Reducing social anxiety, reducing moments of stress, reducing hyperactivity, increasing opportunities for physical aware, uh, uh, activity. What about connecting with your community, which many people say they hardly do anymore? Seeing that neighbor of yours on a walking path, being with your fellow parents at a playground. These are all, taking your dog to a dog park. I mean, all these things actually do matter. We know that this human connectivity is what we strive for. And if the COVID pandemic height of it did not teach us that, we still have a lot more to learn. And looking at a few examples, a few, there's many, of injustice links here. Access to public green spaces, including parks, nature preserves, forests, community gardens, varies, of course, racial and economic uh, variances. This shouldn't be surprising to us, but it continues to be documented Income levels and higher education are positively related to the amount of access people have to nature. That is not justice. The Trust for Public Land Index tells us that neighborhoods mostly compiled of uh, people of color have an average of 44% less access to green space. That is nothing close to justice. According to a 2021 academic report, 74% of communities, that's ridiculous, of color live in nature-deprived de areas. So the magnitude of order of what that means for a young child that does not have that access and those parents and the generational impacts are huge and are being documented also by lived experience. So I make the case here that the inequitable cycle that we are on, and if we continue to perpetuate that, we are never going to get to the goals health goals, justice goals, or conservation goals that we aim for. The most vulnerable of all people needs to continue to be and their needs at the core of our work, and that's just non-negotiable. That is how I see these all working very closely together. And when it comes to tribes and uh, maybe connecting our, um, our tribal communities, our underserved communities, our indigenous, just continuing to listen, I think, to what has been happening and listening and having open, transparent, and often conversation, that goes a long way. We're seeing progress in that, and certainly I do believe this administration is seeing progress in that as well. Uh, continuing to pursue, pursue a collaborative approach, continuing to stay persistent, continuing to show up, continuing to show that you deserve and are worthy of trust. Continuing to honor tribal sovereignty and priorities of tribal nations, this all is very important to our collective success. In our coalition, we have a priorities uh, projects campaign, and this is you know, an effort to provide technical assistance as well as funding capacity to those on the ground, community-related efforts that could use some leveraging, could use some attention, could use some funding. These mechanisms are very important, and whatever the administration can do to continue that, and reducing the burden of um, applying to government grants at times. I know it's hard, but streamlining them would be much more advantageous to a lot of community members as well. 
We also have our second annual policy platform that's going to come out uh, the end of January. That's another opportunity to continue to engage with our members and community members as they were a big part of putting key recommendations together. And then also we are going to have a national conference in the fall of 2024. That will be in a, also another way as a touch point to, co to connect with community members, a part of the America the Beautiful for All Coalition. Excellent. And I just want to say that nature deprived communities is actually one of the key pillars of America the Beautiful that we're uh, prioritizing. I think some great work's been done uh, with people like NSA. Um, all right, Secretary Ross, I want to go on to you. While, while we've been largely focused on the federal lands and waters, voluntary conservation on private lands uh, in, um, is also a major contributor to our uh, conservation progress. Kind of what, what is California's approach uh, to getting the buy-in on conservation practices from farmers, ranchers, foresters, and others? Well, I think it's no secret that oftentimes it feels confrontational when we walk in and say we want to save this species, we want to save this land, because people worry about this is my neighbor or you want my land, and it feels like I'm being asked to take a big risk or this is going to impact my ability for another generation of the family to be able to carry this out. And so being voluntary is very, very key. And if they feel that it's a risk because they're being asked to change a practice or to think about why wouldn't you want to put this strategically, critically important productive ag land into a permanent conservation easement, the peace of mind that comes from doing that and knowing you've done it, not just for yourself, but for generations from now that will never know you, it, 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 make, it creates a different type of setting and it avoids development sprawl and all of the climate and environmental issues that come along with that. But it also, I believe, is so important in an industry that, that many young people don't recognize could be a really satisfying career to be able to grow food, to be able to be a part of an environmental solution, to make sure that everyone has access to this healthy food. Those are the kinds of attributes that come. But what we're trying to do through these incentive programs is also prove the business case with healthy soils practices or pollinator health you're getting long-term benefits that can lower your inputs, can improve the water retention and dry soils like California has. Um, it's good for the species. And at the end of the day, we cannot have healthy farms without healthy ecosystems. And so making these investments and being able to prove that out, I think also presents a business case. But I go back to what drives the people who work on the land and depend on the land is that opportunity to know I've saved it in the right way for future generations, let alone being able to feed them well in the process. Excellent. We can't have healthy farms without healthy ecosystems. I love that. Um, Shannon. Uh, we've talked a lot about land conservation here today, but inland waters are also a significant, um, play a significant role in nature-based uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. So can you tell us more about that important role and share a, a place uh, or two where, there's, where that's happening? <clears throat> my, um, maybe my favorite topic, inland waterways. Um, so I, I think this is an area, in, in the last panel, I identified this as a, as a place where I think we have some of the greatest gains to be won, um, and is in our inland, wa in our inland waterway restoration. Um, and what's great is that we're operating at, at two, two scales. We're operating and having a lot of success at very large scales in places like the Everglades, where we're dealing with 18,000 square miles, twice the size of New Jersey, and that's the, that's the, that's the scale at which we're operating, or a place like the Boundary Waters, where we're, you know, activating mineral withdrawals to protect the Superior, uh, you know, National Forest and the whole Boundary Waters in northern Minnesota. So operating at very big scales, but we are also winning at a really, at really small scales. I have spent time in West Virginia. I've spent time in South Carolina, where I've been um, in the truck with local engineers, you know, like the local town engineer who wants to show me the new, um, you know, bottomless culvert that they've just put in on this rural road um, and to actually show me before and after photographs of a small tributary stream that was flooding their road regularly for 30 years because of inadequate culverts. Now, I'm a civil engineer, so this gets me excited, maybe uh, disproportionately, but it's so exciting because as soon as you put 
that bottomless culvert in, the river remembers what it was supposed to do, and it looks like the river again almost immediately. And it doesn't matter if you do it on a small stream or if you do it on a mighty river. That's the wonderful part about um, river and stream restoration. Then the only thing you have to worry about is beavers coming along and building and damming it back up, you know, in the natural way. Um, but what you find is that natural processes of these rivers recover almost immediately. So you get the multiple benefits of improved flood protection and mitigation, improved ecological conditions in the river. You almost always, these are almost always safer for people, both to drive over and to navigate through. And then when you start to look at the food chain and ecological processes of these, of these places, anadromy, for example. So anadromous species that swim upstream like salmon, they, it's, 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 it's almost magical. They will have disappeared from a river for 20 years. You, you restore passage and they're back next year. It's like an ad went out <laughs> among all of the fish in the ocean and the river's open again. And, um, it's so, and some of these investments, you can get these big gains for v relatively small investments. I've seen culverts pulled out for $250,000 replaced and, and restoring tens, tens of miles, maybe 30 miles of river stream by pulling out one culvert or replacing it with a more modern structure. And when you do that, when you start to restore watersheds, you start to really, you're operating at a larger scale than you think you are. And if you look at an inland waterway map of the United States, you know, you will immediately be drawn to the mighty rivers of the West, you know, the Colorado, the Columbia, the Snake. Um, but as soon as you come east of the Mississippi, it's like a spider web. And I don't know, it might be hundreds of thousands of miles of river and stream if you counted them all up. And when you're on the ground in these places, you realize that this is some of, this is where we're seeing the, some of the, the highest density of, of newly endangered species are in these small river streams, particularly in the southeastern United States. And so there's both challenge and anxiety, but it's coupled with opportunity. And this approach that we're taking, which is community led, right? Um, these ideas come up from community. These communities know where these rivers are. They know where these streams are impaired. They, they know where flooding is happening and they can tell us where it's happening. We just then need to invest in that vision. So, um, it's, it's the work that I'm the, I mean, I spent 25 years working on the Everglades. So I know, <clears throat> excuse me, I know I've seen it. Like I know what's possible. And one of the big challenges we'll have, and I'll end with this thought is we really, I, I often say to my colleagues in the Everglades that we're going to succeed a lot of the time and we're going to fail sometimes. We're going to try some things that we fail at. But the worst failure is a failure of imagination. That's the worst failure. So when we succeed, we have to tell the story of that success, right? We have to show people what's possible so that communities, we broaden their imagination so that when they see a canal or an altered stream that looks really terrible and acts really terrible, and we help them imagine, wow, you can get your wiggle, you can put the wiggle back in your river. Um, that's a really good thing. And then, and not only that, we'll invest, we'll help you do it. Um, I think that's just a win-win. Thank you, Shannon. I have to say this went way too fast. Uh, we were going to actually go on a little bit more, but we, we seem to be out of time. No, 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 not, no. I think it was great. Um, thank you, everybody on this panel. Uh, could you please give them a round of applause? Yeah. Thank you to our amazing panelists. This concludes our events for the day. Come back tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.